Dear students, in the previous lectures I talked about the histological structures of the bones and started describing the bone development. This is what I will continue today. As you know, the bones are hard tissue and they cannot develop in a usual way uh, from directly from Mesenheim because of the hardness, it cannot increase from uh, inside. Uh, uh, first, a structure, a soft tissue, will develop from another uh, tissue and that will be transformed to bone. Depending on what is the primary tissue, if it's connective tissue, we talk about the endosmal or intramembranous ossification. And when the first tissue is a cartilage, we talk about the enchondral ossification or cartilaginous ossification. The endosmal or intermembranous classification was described in details in the previous lecture. Now I will talk in details in the other one. First, I like to mention that the whole uh, bone development is the primary goal of this talk is to understand how the long bones develop. The long bones develop, first of all, uh, from a cartilage bed. The mesenchymal cells will form a cartilage which has the same size and shape as the bone, uh, of course, suitable to the particular age of the, uh, of the embryo. Uh, then it grows. The longitudinal grow, growth is uh, uh, due to the endochondral ossification. I will uh, talk about the details later on. And the thickening by adding additional layers on the surface from the perichondrium. And this is what, uh, this is the mechanism is endosmal ossification. Now, let's, talk, uh, let's describe in details the and chondral, chondral ossification, how it happens. The first step is that the cartilage bed is develops and the mesenchymal cells will turn, differentiate into cartilage cells. This is a very young cartilage. You can see many dividing cells are here. These are practically mesenchymal cells. However, in between them, you can see a couple of elongated cells. They are already differentiated into uh, uh, chondroblast and chondrocytes. And this white area between the cells shows that we have significant quantity of intercellular substance, which also shows the presence of differentiated chondrocytes. Uh, the cartilage fits the final size and shape of the bone. As I mentioned, I think in a previous uh, lecture, this is a human embryo. This is the first and the second phalanx, and you can see it's fully cartilaginous, and the shape more or less fits the final. Uh, the uh, long bones, first, it develops from all of cartilage, and from the middle of the, the structure below through the perichondrium, vessels break into that. As you know, cartilage has no vessels inside, so this is something new. And the whole transformation process will go into the two, in the direction of the two ends. This uh, process takes time, practically years. This is why in a preparation, which is half made through, we can see any single step of the development from the original cartilage till the ready-made bone. So if we study, because this way, this situation progressing, if we study in the opposite direction, we make a time travel. Uh, and in a single preparation, we can study every single steps of the bone development. This is our... Uh, the model, what we will study, this is practically a rat tibia. We use rat, not human, because it doesn't fit the uh, microscopic glass. And it ha the things happen in exactly the same way as in human. Now, let's see what we have. Uh, the various uh, stages of the transformation described as zones. Uh, this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, small picture, I will show you the, uh, the location of the zones and the magnified picture, what is the internal structure of that. The first thing is actually the resting zone in which we have a young cartilage. This looks, looks like that. The details were described just before. The first step of the transformation is that we have little groups of cells, relatively small cells. This is the result of multiplication of dividing the cells in this chondrocytes divide. This is unique because the differentiated cells usually do not divide, but on a biological signal these cells do. So they form little patches of cells 
And this is typical to the second zone multiplication zone, which is located somewhere here. In the next uh, step is that the cells increase in size, and because they do not fit the space, they push each other, and then making an elongated cylindric structure instead of this spheric uh, group of cells. This is named the generation zone. First, it sounds strange, because uh, if somebody or something increasing in size, we think this is a, a sign of the well-being. They are feeling very well because I'm big and strong. In, uh, in this particular case, it's just the opposite. The cells, is, the cells are dying. Why the cells, the dying cells, increase in size? Uh, this is due to the protoglycan disintegration in them. These cells, the task of the chondrocytes, all of the chondrocytes, is to produce protoglycans to the interstitial space. Whenever they have a metabolic distress, they start working and start dying, the already ready-made proteoglycans suddenly fall apart into small molecules, glucose and others, and this uh, uh, process increases the number of the molecules and the osmotic pressure depends on the number of the molecules, which increases tremendously, and that draws water inside. So the disintegration of the proteoglycans and the consequential increase of osmotic pressure and water uptake makes these cells bigger. So these cells, in the consequence of this, increasing and do not fit in space, like make elongated cylindric structure, looks like a corn cob. Uh, the uh, other th change is that the interstitial substance become bluer. You can see they compare these colors. And bluer color mean that the more acidic proteoglycans accumulate here. More acidic proteoglycans means they, they are harder. And uh, this is the primary goal of this process. The cells sacrifice themselves, they die out. Whatever is remain is this practically cylindric wall uh, of the original interstitial substance of the, the cartilage. And this makes a solid framework of the following processes, and they stay quite a long, a long period of time. Those uh, uh, textbook writers who can think only in two dimensions, uh, they notice this one and they uh, name them beams, and they name directing beams. We know already that these are walls of the cylinder, and this is just a cross-section of these walls, but traditionally we name this directing beams. This is a kind of Eisenstein slides in which you can see the same processes in a different color. Uh, the next uh, uh, zone is a sudden change. Uh, from this pale area become a very dark stained area, and this is the mesenchymal invasion zone. The reason for that is that mesenchymal cells grow in. They come blood vessels behind them just to uh, ensure the food, and we have a lot of mesenchymal cells. On the top, we have these ugly looking multinucleated cells. These are the chondroclasts, and the chondroclasts eat up the dying cells and clean up the cavity of these cylinders. The wall of the cylinders remain, as I mentioned, very long. But these cells cleaning up the, uh, the chondrocytes and making room for the following processes. What happens later on? Uh, the stem cells, which are coming behind the chondroclast, will differentiate into osteoprogenitor cells. You remember these are the cells which are de genetically directed in a certain direction, and, uh, but they do not differ histologically from the stem cells. And then they become osteoblasts, those cells which start doing something. As I mentioned, all the blasts have a lot of uh, ribosomes in the cytoplasm, and these make blue the cytoplasm, and these cells sitting in the inner wall of the cylinders, and they start producing uh, the first the osteoid material, the organic part of the intercellular substance of the bones. Uh, the next zone is the ossification zone, when all of this process progress. Here you can see an example. This pale blue in the middle is identical to the interstitial substance of the cartilage. So this is what we name the directing beam traditionally. 
On the surface, you can see osteoblasts. Uh, you can recognize them in the blue cytoplasm. We have a single layer, but taking all around this developing piece of bone. Some of the osteoblasts who started the work earlier already produced enough substance, this uh, red substance, the osteoid, and they stopped the activity, reduced the activity, and then turned to osteocyte. Once again, this red substance is the uh, osteoid. Uh, here you can see a slightly more progressed uh, area with a larger magnification. This pale blue is still the directing beam. The uh, blue cells, cells with blue cytoplasm all around the osteoblasts. Here you can see cells with pink cytoplasm. These are already the cells, former osteoblasts, who uh, produced enough uh, osteoid and reduce the quantity. And this red area is the osteoid, the organic component of the bone, mostly collagen and the little proteoglycans. And finally, this dark blue uh, rim is the calcification. So it's nothing to do with the directing beam, but this is the furthest developing bone and part of the osteoid, especially, which is the earliest produced, already start calcifying, and this is the way how the bone is finally formed. Uh, the process is not finished yet. You can see still developing the bone. You can see even the remnant of the directing beams, but the blood cells already moved in. This large number of soul cells, many of them has no nucleus, just red cells. You know, these are the erythrocytes, as you know it from the kindergarten. And the bone, the blood production, the blood formation, will be settled down here, and this will be here between these bony uh, pieces all along our life. This is the story of the enchondral ostification. This is how from inside the bone, turns, uh, the cartilage turns to be bone. Uh, the bone is, uh, must thicken, must be thicker, because uh, our bone is much thicker than that of the embryo, so it must increase in thickness because we have no cartilage cells here, we have other things, the endosmal ossification coming from the periosteum, originally perichondrium and later periosteum. How it's made, you can see a very nice dense collagenous connective tissue here. You can see this needle-like wavy nuclei. These are the fibrocytes and between them you can hear the collagen fibers. However, in a for con connective tissue unusual way, we have round cells among the cells, and these are stem cells. These are guest cells in this particular piece of collagen, the, uh, connective tissue, and they, the usual way, as I mentioned, differentiate into progenitor cells, then osteoblasts, and doing the same step as I described for both the endosmal and the enchondral ossification, they producing the uh, bone. The whole finish, the whole process is just going on, but already appear the big multinucleated cells. These are the osteoclasts and start rebuilding the bone. These are not terrorists which destroy whatever the others did, but these are responsible for the transformation of the bone from the irregular uh, bony pieces into the regular canals, what we named osteon. We will describe that a little bit later on. So the uh, ossification, the thickening, comes from the perichondrium, or later it's named periosteum. The same tissue changes the name. The poor tissue doesn't know that, but whenever we have cartilage below that, we name perichondrium, and we have bone below the same tissue, in, uh, as a consequence of the bone formation, we named periconium. Uh, probably you must remember this uh, name, bony collar. Some books uh, mention that, and some of the examiners like to hear that. At least till the exam, you must uh, remember that. Uh, the, the growing of the bone, uh, once again, is appositional. As you remember, I used this expression a couple of times. It means that new, la new layers are uh, put on the surface of that, just keep putting that, and this is how the whole structure increases in size. Now, uh, this is the next uh, chapter. Let's summarize. 
what are the factors that makes the long bones bigger, how they grow. This is a question in both the end of the first semester and also in the final exam. And unfortunately, most of the students, about 90% in my about 40 years of experiments, fail on that. But this is a very easy. The problem is not the, uh, because they not fail because they don't know, but that they don't know what to talk about. No, let's see. Let the, whoever is looking that hopefully everybody get five on that. It has three factors: the bone goes longitudinally, bone thickens, and finally the cavity inside the bone cavity, the medullary cavity will increase. Let's see how the longitudinal growth go on. Uh, as you remember, uh, the, uh, the long bones first, they have a cartilage bed, then it starts, uh, ves vessels intrude inside, and we, the ossification starts. Whatever I didn't talk about that, and it will be uh, the place to talk about, is that not only the ossification starts from the middle, but later on, also from the two ends. This is what we name the secondary ossification center. Whatever is the middle is the primary. In the consequence of these ossification centers, the poor cartilage cells, which still we have multiplying cartilage cells here, this is a multiplication zone, will be pinched between two enemies. All of them try to kill them, transfer them into bone, and, but these cells multiply rapidly. Consequently, they always uh, have uh, uh, a certain cartilage in a certain period of time. And this cartilage, multiplying cartilage, this persistent bone in the entire childhood, we named epiphyseal plate. If you can x-ray picture from a child hand, for instance, you can see uh, th this is the radius, this is the ulna, and on the distal end, both of them, we have an x-ray, fear x-ray thumb sprint area. This is cartilage. This is the epiphyseal plate, and the cells multiply here. As long as he will multiplying cells in this area, the bone can grow because we got bigger and bigger mass. At the moment when, for some reason, the cells reduce the multiplication and the, uh, and the bony transformation over through them, the growth of the bone stops and the both bone cannot grow anymore. You know from the everyday life that during the childhood we are growing. So the entire childhood we have this epiphyseal place. Uh, the, so the uh, uh, moment whenever all of the uh, 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 cartilage cells die and the ossification goes through them, we named closing the epiphyseal plate. This will uh, ensure the final body height. What causes that? For many, many processes, uh, whatever is, uh, takes place at the end of the childhood is due to the uh, up, uh, ongoing of the sexual steroid. In the ladies, the estrogen. In the males, the testosterone. These also act on these poor uh, chondrocytes. They reduce their multiplication ran, uh, ra uh, rate. Consequently, the ossification overgrew them and kill all of the cells and stops growing. If you know that, we can explain a couple of obvious everyday things. In most of the population, the men are longer than the women. Why? Because the maturation of the women, both mental and bodily, is quicker, faster, earlier than that of the boys. Two, three years earlier. Consequently, the ladies the estrogen appears in the lady's body three, two, three years earlier than in the boys, the testosterone, because when they stop growing. If you remember, in the elementary school, uh, when you lined up, for instance, in the, uh, 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 in, in the school, the ladies were not at the end of the row, in the middle or mostly in the front of the row. But suddenly, around age 10, 12, depending on the area, or 14, they stopped growing, and the boys still going on growing and become taller. The reason for that, because the maturation, the sexual maturation of the males in every population is a couple of years later than the ladies. This is why they grow longer. 
The other one we can explain as also general uh, things that those populations who live in the southern part of the world usually shorter and the Nordic people longer. Like an average Scandinavian, original Scandinavian, is longer than an average Italian. The reason also uh, uh, reason for that is also this. The sexual maturation and also the sexual activity. See the sexual activity, let me say, between the Mediterranean uh, boys or girls and that of the Scandinavian is illumination dependent. On that area where the average daily illumination is longer, the sexual maturation is earlier. Whenever it's lower, it comes later. For instance, an average Italian girl has its first menstruation two, three, sometimes four years earlier than that of the average Scandinavian lady. Consequently, they have time to go further up, similar things even further up for the boys. This is why the Scandinavian boys and girls are much longer than those in the Mediterranean area. Okay, so the first factor of the growth of the bone, the first part of answering this question, is the longitudinal. The second one is a thickening. I already described in detail, I just want to remind you. The periosteal bone formation, which is a type of the intramembranous door formation, will add more and more layers, and this ensures the thickening. Medullary cavity, the cavity inside the bone to make it uh, less uh, uh, lightweight, more lightweight, uh, this is due to the osteoclast. Osteoclast chewing up the inner side quicker than the outer side, consequently the hole increases. So summarizing, the answer for five to this question is the growth of the bones longitudinal ensured by the epiphyseal plate, thickening by the periosteal bone formation, so, uh, intermembranous bone formation, and the medullary cavity increasing is due to the osteoclast. And you don't have to talk about the details of the intercultural genus, ossification, or whatever, but usually uh, uh, students say who fail on this question. Next thing, whatever, look about the remodeling. Both bone formation, both the intermembranous and the cartilaginous ossification result in an irregular bone. They have bony beams in a very irregular way, and it's a little untidy way. And our final bones are very regular, have very nice parallel running osteoids. How they develop, this is due to remodeling. And also, the remodeling, after this the first uh, uh, setting up the structure, still goes on and continues until even 100 years old uh, people has changing the structure of the bone. This is about 10% of the bone changes each year. There is a difference between the spongy part, which is more than one quarter of the spongy part of the bone will be exchanged in a, in a year. The compact is much slower, about 4% yearly. Let's see how it happens. I made a little animation for that. This is an ugly looking osteoclast, about 200 micrometer in diameter, and they chew up everything and making an empty cylinder. It draws uh, stem cells, and those which differentiate the onteoblast, and layer by layer, a new layer develops. So for the osteoclast develops from outside to inside, and this is why we have circular layers of cells, because they make a kind of concentric area. Finally, only the vessels remain in the middle, giving the Heversian canal. Let's see once again. So this is the original structure. It doesn't look any borders, just the osteoclast make a tunnel. And from outside to inside, step by step, new and new layers. Cell layer, osteoid layer, cell layer, osteoid layer, whatever, develops from outside to inside. Finally, just the Heversian canal remain, and this is the, uh, uh, well, well, this is the inside of the cell. Uh, this is why we have these Heversian canals. Whatever remained between then after the uh, osteoclast drilled it, this is remain as the intercal intercalar lamellus. Finally, I want to talk about the regeneration of the bone. 
Unfortunately, every now, now and then we break our bone, and this looks something like that if it's bad. So we have bony, broken bony pieces, uh, even sometimes the soft tissues are broken, sometimes not, and you can see large quantities of blood here. The blood doesn't come only from the soft tissues. As you know, the blood supply of the bone is very good. Consequently, most of this uh, blood comes directly from the bone. How it will be repaired? Because the bone has good blood supply, living cells. Consequently, it can be repaired if you let it. First of all, first step is to make fibrin. Fibrin is a, coagulated, uh, is a protein in the coagulated blood which binds these cells together and stops the blood from flowing. Uh, into this uh, fibrin, uh, the, from the stem cells around, uh, the, uh, which is exist in our body all over our life as parasites around the capillaries, they differentiate into fibroblasts and they make connective tissue fibers and they connect the end. This is what we name the connective tissue callus. This is uh, a little bit larger than the original things because the blood flow out, but the connecting the broken end of the bone. Uh, this connective tissue will turns to be cartilage. This is what we name the cartilaginous callus. And this cartilage, as I mentioned in the intercultural ossification, the very same way, it will be transformed into bone. This is what we name the bony callus. Uh, all of this structure thicker, larger than the original bone. This is what we named callus. And during the remodeling, it, it takes the uh, structure of the original bone. Even if you see in X-ray examination, in a two, three years, we have no sign of the original uh, break if uh, we let the bone cure properly. Uh, so uh, you can see a very nice series of pictures. This was a child who was broke the arm and it was pretty much neglected and it has a very big uh, callus with two not really fitting piece of uh, bone. In a couple of years this bony callus will regress and pull these parts of the bone together and finally in a few other years we had this almost original uh, stage of the bone, so nature can do it miracle, but if we help, it makes it much uh, quicker and much more reliable. The reason for that is a fixation. If we have the broken end of the bones far away from each other, we have a big blood, big connective tissue, and always there is a possibility to not to uh, get fixed properly and takes a lot of time until this few, few area become bony. And in this case, the size of the bone can differ and so on. So it's uh, very imperative to fix the bone as close as possible the broken end. If it's within one millimeter, it can cure in one or two weeks completely if we do not move it. Uh, the fixation happens traditionally by plaster. You can see this poor guy probably was hit by the wife or what, whoever, and this is fully wrapped in plaster. The plaster is hard, however, between the plaster and the bone we have soft tissues. Additionally, having this type of plaster is very boring and also it's very itchy between the plaster and the skin and the owner start moving just to uh, 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 reduce these uncomfortable things. What happens then? If this is an early stage, the fibrin will break and the another bleeding starts and makes a fibrin. This is not serious, but uh, it happens. If a connective tissue callus breaks, it starts bleeding again and the whole process starts again. The problem is if the cartilaginous callus breaks because in the cartilage there is no vessel. Because there is no vessel, it cannot be cured. So if you break the, connective tissue, the cartilaginous callus, it remains broken. This is why we have a false joint which makes sometimes the movement uh, impossible. This way, the curing can be done only if surgically remove the uh, cartilage and let start the whole process again. Uh, the, uh, the modern th fixation is the kind of orthopedic surgery, metal things. The 
two broken ends fixed to each other very close and very firm with metal things. The advantage of this one is that the patient in two or three days can walk without any problem and the uh, healing of this process happens in two or three weeks and complex curing is, uh, will happen there. This is what I wanted to talk about today. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your attention.